Welcome back to the Talk and Chatter Experience powered by Gasoline Alley, Harley Davidson. Today's guest is custom bike builder and shop owner, Tom Gilroy. Welcome, mate. Thanks, man. How's it going? Yeah, good. Is that, uh, is that in- introduction correct, mate? Pretty much. Pretty much. So who yeah. is Tom-, Tom Gilroy? I'm a, a bloke from the Gold Coast that has a little custom shop, purpose-built moto. I uh, started it a few years ago, and I guess that's why I'm talking to you now. Um, but other than that, I like diving, traveling, long walks on the beach, my dog Peanut, and red wine and pasta. Mate, that's such a better introduction than what I just came up with. So, yeah, I did. <laughs> always feel a little bit one dimensional on these things, and I'm just a bike builder. But yeah, that's me, man. That's the thing. And uh, you're an electrical electrical engineer? Yeah, I come from a background in electrical, which has sort of given me the start with a yep. lot of the parts and stuff we build, um, like moto lighting and all that. Yeah. Uh, but was pretty happy after 11 years to leave that in my dust and, yep. and you know, really put my focus into the shop for the last 12 months now. Were you always someone that was uh, very hands-on, like fabrication, a bit of everything like that? Yeah, not not so much fabrication. I learned to weld when I started building bikes. That was yep. sort of my catalyst into learning all of that stuff. Um, but I did grow up just sort of tinkering around with stuff on my dad's property and you know, cars when I was a kid and all that sort of stuff. I had bikes when I was younger, but always, you know, just tinkering around with them, never really ripping in too hard until I, you know, started having people ask me to do it for them. Yeah, right. So that was, uh, wh- when did that sort of come? Did that come a bit, bit later on, obviously? Yeah. Uh, well, I built my first bike in, well, over like a couple of years in 2015 and 16, I think. Yeah. And then shortly after that, I had a guy asked me to do one for him and then just sort of snowballed from there. So it happened a little bit by accident. Oh, really? So you built something for yourself initially and someone seen it and then the next thing sort of that sort of traditional snowball. Yeah, pretty much. I was just like every other Joe Blow on the internet putting photos of his weekend projects out there and then something took and someone resonated with it and then from then on out, I just kept on getting busier. Wow. Did you ride bikes as a kid? Uh, yeah, since I was like 14. Yeah, okay, yep. So you got into it, got in, um, tinkered ov- obviously a lot in the fa- farm sort of style. Yeah, I had just always old bikes around. Yep, just tinker, tinker, tinker. Yeah, well, you had to if you wanted to ride them. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and what was the first one that you built as a, as a custom for yourself? I had a, uh, well, I still do have a 1983 GS550. Yeah, right. Still like ride it every weekend. Really? Yeah. Is that sort of like what Max had? Was he's a 850 though? Uh, his was 650. Yeah, 650, like sorry. so, so similar. It's not even funny. Yeah, Mine's right. cooler though. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So you did that. And then while you're running a, or while you're part of a big corporation doing your electrical business, you mm. electrical work, you started your business, Purpose, Purpose Built Moto. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, been a ride. I've been full time at it for 12 months now. Yeah. Um, but for four years or so, I was working full time as an electrician, traveling around to mine sites and different sort of like heavy industry hotspots. Yep. Uh, and then working in the garage on weekends, and that I was still sort of pumping out customer builds at that time. I yeah. was just not sleeping very much and never talking to my mates on weekends. I was fully committed in my my little home workshop, and until like I think it was 2018. We got this place here, um, Jamison from Timeless Auto Trim, wanted to go out on his own as well. So we went halves in this shed. We had a few people come in and out in the office, filmmakers and stuff, the guys that I work with on um, Wide of the Mark and yeah. Handcrafted. They sort of, we all sort of started around this same time and started to gain momentum. So we were in this little like hive of um, productivity for a while with those boys and they've now moved on to Sydney Mm. Bigger and better things. Um, so is that um, Jack, uh, Jake and Cameron? Jake and Cam, yeah, yeah from Cam. Electric Bubble. Yep. Um, we miss you guys. Come back to the Gold Coast soon. But, yeah, I sort of um, got this shed and then we started working in here and then that sort of saw the end of Handcrafted. And then because we were in such close quarters, we did more and more projects. They helped me build my YouTube to start off with and all that sort of stuff. Um 
so yeah, I owe a lot, a lot to those guys and, and then it sort of grew into that wide of the mark project that we did through Tasmania, which is ridiculous. I don't even know how he pulled it off, but yeah, yeah that's, that's me so far. Did you like uh, social media and YouTube right, plays a big part in your current business. Did you ever picture yourself being a creator on YouTube? No, I sort of avoided it like the plague. I, <laughs> and especially starting out, like yeah. for me, I never ever wanted to do that just because I saw these guys doing it and it was so disingenuous. Like it's, I mean, I'm sure that there are some good guys and if you're listening to this and you're a YouTube bike builder, I'm not talking about you, but yep. a lot of the shit that I see is they're a YouTuber first and a bike builder second. So it's sort of like clickbait in a way yep. and that sucks. Mm. Um, so I sort of consciously wanted to make sure that my priorities were right and that I can keep my priorities right while having that on the side yeah. and it definitely does help what I do by being able to reach more people um, if nothing else for the the part sales and stuff like that just sort of getting the stuff that I make in front of more people helps I think if I was just building bikes and I didn't have the the parts business on the side I probably wouldn't bother doing it it is a lot of work mm. um, but yeah I think it's a matter of just doing it right making sure that I was uh, not letting that compromise what I was doing and why I was doing it. Mm, makes sense. Tough. Yeah, it's such a tough balance, isn't it? Trying to balance the you know, creative side of creating something for people to see, but still we want something to – I guess education. Yours is like an education piece as well, isn't it? Yeah, in a way. I sort of – I try not to be too teachy about it. It's more just like a window into my workshop. Mm -hmm. I don't really let people visit here or anything like that. If you want to come in, it's appointment only just because I'm not sitting in the office waiting to give someone a quote. I'm hands-on all day, yep. every day. Uh, and if people are coming in here just to hang out and want to chat, that stops me from doing what I need to be doing. Um, so that was my way of sort of having people in here as a bit of a fly on the wall. If they get something out of it, that's awesome. And I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, I try to explain my stuff pretty clearly and – just little things that I always struggle with and you sort of feel like a dick for asking anyone. I yep. used to do it a lot because I uh, have no shame, but you know, I'm sure a lot of people have these random questions that go unanswered just because they don't want to ask. Yeah, that's, that, 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 it, that would happen all the time and no matter what field, it's one of the things that you do see, hey? Yeah. So, happened to myself. Yeah, it's if you don't know and you're sort of like, you're not trained for it, I'm not a mechanic or anything and I know a lot of garage tinkers aren't either so if you do have questions and stuff like that it's intimidating to to ask for help for a lot of people so that was sort of my way of maybe giving a little bit back and yep. you know i definitely do get something out of it for myself so it's not so completely selfless yeah exactly did you like this is a creative pursuit as well as it's a business pursuit we're always a creative person mm, i guess sort of yeah not really i never considered myself a creative i guess um these bikes now are where I put that energy into. Um, before it was like furniture and my house and stuff like that. I always, you know, would build stuff and just yep. renovating my house. That was my only outlet. And then putting a lot of energy into sort of travel and experience, which, you know, helped broaden my perspective and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I guess now I have would potentially consider myself a uh, creative in some respect, but yep. yeah, at the end of the day, I'm just sort of knocking around in a shed with my fabricator and having a bit of fun. <laughs> it's such a good way to look at it. Yeah. I guess that's, I mean, you can't really take yourself too seriously. It's, they're just fucking motorcycles. Yeah. End of the day, it's just two wheels and a <laughs> <Yes>. throttle. <laughs> Nothing too complicated, mate. So it is two wheels and a throttle. So how many, as a rough guide, bikes have you put out? Um, I sort of, well, I've only just had my first proper run at a year. Yep. You know, before it was like in my, uh, my old career, I would be out for three weeks at a time and home for four or five days and then out for another week and then back on the weekend. So I think in total, maybe like... I don't know, 20 to 25. Yep. Um, you know, as soon as they're out the door, I'm on to the next. I'd, Just constant. Yeah. I don't hold any uh, 
any candles for these bikes. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it is a revolving door on the shop. We are pumping them out a bit quicker now, but that still doesn't stop my customers from getting the shits at me taking too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's a consistent uh, struggle in my life. Was it a, um, to get into business in, in this business as well, was it a bit of a scary thing at the time? Maybe not so much scary, but was it, um, did it feel like a big jump to get into a shop in the Gold Coast and in this industry? Did it feel like a big jump? No, not at all. No? It was sort of, I mean, I don't want to say it was easy, but it, it was something that I never really thought about. Yep. It's tough. I put heaps of fucking work into it, but yep. it was, um, there was never a point where I made a conscious decision to say, righto, I'm going to run a bike shop now. Yep. Um, it was more of, like I said before, I, I had a project, I built that. Someone asked me to do one for them. That happened during that point in time. Something else came through the door. I started doing little fab jobs for people. And um, just for my own bike, I designed a few parts and had them made. So it um, it just sort of happened. Yeah. So th there was never like real struggle to, you know, get my foot in the door or whatever because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really concerned about what anyone else is doing around me. I try to focus on what I'm doing. So... You know, the the guys that are doing similar stuff on the Gold Coast are more friends than anything. I don't yep. see anyone out there as competition to me. Um, you know, if they land a job over me, good luck to them. I'm, you know, it doesn't, yep. it doesn't really work like that, I don't think. I think if you've got that mindset, you're already lost. For sure. And you're always looking in the mirror. Yeah, for sure. But um, it's actually something really special you said in, in your movie, in the first movie, Handcrafted was basically like that is the scene down here is, is a lot like that. So you can rock up at a cafe or whatever, go for a beer with someone and it is just – you might build bikes and that as a competitor but it's not like that, is it? No, not at all. I think like the guy closest to doing what I do on the Gold Coast is a really good friend of mine, Justin yep. from Pop Band Classics. He's sort of – you know, he does a lot of older stuff and just fucking wild stuff yep. but that's probably like um, – if you were to look at it that way, my closest competitor that does a similar stuff to what I do, but we sort of, I'm down at his shed two or three times a week and he comes up for a beer here on a Friday. It's never been like that. And I hope yep. it never gets like that. hundred percent. And yeah, like, it just dragged me down. Yeah. You don't need that. No. <laughs> so Got enough troubles in my life. Fuck yeah. That's <laughs> one of the things that, and same, same deal going to the movie when was, was that your, your concept handcrafted? Uh, it was my concept to like grow it. The the guys at Electric Bubble came to me with the idea to like do that concept on me. Yep. And they'd actually done a couple of cool like, I don't know if they were called handcrafted, but they were very similar of, you know, just dudes making cool stuff like surfboard shapers. And yep. I think maybe like a photographer or something like that. They did something quite similar um, with this guy in Sydney that does, uh, camera surf housing called salty surf housing mm -hmm. does like underwater stuff so they've done like a similar concept there um but at that point in time when i was approached i didn't know cameron or jake then um they sort of had this idea i thought it was really cool but i also thought that i didn't have that much to give yeah. um i'd been doing it for it what felt like three fucking weeks at that point <laughs> in time i was like i haven't really got a story to tell yet yep. but from the parts that i was doing and selling I'd gotten to at least interact with a few guys around Australia that had far more experience and I just thought that they were way more interesting than I was. So that was when we decided to sort of grow that idea yep. to not just include me but the the seven other guys that we are that we spoke to as well. Mm. And it, it was way better for it. I mean like everyone's probably sick of hearing me talking but the guys that we got on board were sort of just that real salt of the earth. They, you know, they don't make a lot of noise about what they do. Their work speaks for themselves and they're just sort of in there because they really love it. And that's what I was so stoked to be able to put out there and show people that it's not all like egocentric chopper competitions and this wild shit that happens overseas that we're so accustomed to seeing. But these are like real guys in tiny little sheds building like wild, wild shit. Yeah. That guy, I forget his name, sadly. I think it might have even been Scott. He's the built up the sidecars for lots of years. Oh, yeah, Scott, yeah. I love some of his work, eh? Yeah, he, he builds like real weird stuff, which is why it was fun to go see him. Scott's yep. like, um, 
like a little pseudo moto dad for me. Right. I like, and so like a lot of those guys, I will still talk to them now asking like weird questions. So yep. for Scotty, when I was building the Vittoria sidecar, mm -hmm. um, I was having dramas making it handle right. So I called him up and he was sort of giving me pointers. And also like when I was fabricating all the mounts for that sidecar to be on the Triumph, yep. helping me out with that sort of stuff. And he, um, yeah, that's sort of like advice that he could lend because I know that he's from that, that's that his sort thing. of space. Yeah, for sure. Yep. And it was cool to hear him talk as one of the older guys that we had on board for that project. He just has this wealth of experience yep. and has really like lived through it. He's an old salt. He grew up at a speedway with his dad racing yep. and yeah, he just had a really cool perspective and his interview is probably one of my favorites in the film because it's real entertaining and he's just got like yep. that jolly disposition, you <laughs> he know, does. he's just good to talk to. He's got character. There's just real character 100%. in him. That's that's same. If you, if you put it into segments for me, that one of that, that segment for just, just his character and yeah. what he's been in. I really appreciate, you know, it was really a real good part of the film. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And that, that afternoon it was actually almost by, by act. So we had like a bunch of builders earmarked, but we had very minimal time. Like we, we filmed that over like a week and a half yep. between Christmas and new years. Oh really? So it's not even a week and a half. It was a week. So oh. between Chrissy and new years, we filmed that and, uh, on like a shoestring is just me, the two boys in like a car um that i'd hired so i was supposed to take my car at the time yep. but i think it was two days before christmas so i was having a christmas party at my house with all the boys around and there was this drunk driver on my street <laughs> yep. hit the front of my ute at 50 k's no brakes and just he pushed my car into three other cars behind me that's how hard he hit it so it was a, a four drive ford ranger so nice. it's not a small car yeah. by any means it was full of shit in the back so I pushed it and smashed these three cars. So my car was totaled yep. two days before Chrissy and three days before I had to leave for that film trip. No. So it was high pressure. Worst and, time of year to be yeah, have that. You try fucking hiring a car yeah. on the Gold Coast two days before Christmas. Yeah. Biggest travel time of the year. Yeah. It was <laughs> expensive, but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, it was worth it in the end. So anyway, we had a builder pull out in Sydney um, it's always funny when we do these projects, like even happen with Wider Mark, we'll ask these people to get on board and yep. like, we have no fucking money to do this thing. So we're not going to pay you to do it. So it's sort of like these people don't quite understand what we're trying to do and how cool it's going to be. So these guys said no. And we're like, all right, well, fuck, we'll show you champ. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and we ended up like, we'd done the loop down to the furthest we went was Canberra. Mm -hmm. And then we were coming back and then we had a spot to fill and I was like, I know the guy. So Scotty was our last stop and turned out to be absolutely incredible. Wow. We rocked up, we were filming, all his mates were out the front having beers and like punching darts before we went out <laughs> for that ride scene on all of his bikes that he's built. Old Australia. Yeah, it was proper, it was good. So that was all his mates that were on those bikes when you see him in the shop? Yeah, That's yeah. All. So he'd like obviously in his local area, he'd built a yep. bunch of bikes for guys around and yep. he had a couple of race bikes on the bench that we sort of talked about. And um, yeah, then we once we'd finished filming, we, we went out for a ride. Yeah, cool. And did you did you take one of your bikes on that tour as well or you couldn't? No, obviously? I didn't. On a couple of the spots, we, um, we got bikes off the guys. Yep. Um, but because it was such a like a last minute, whirlwind yep. of a thing we didn't get the chance and even like um brad miller when we interviewed him he'd at that time he'd like lent his bike to his brother or something so we didn't no. get to go riding with him and yep. um but yeah that's just the way things are when you do things last minute and on a bit of a whim that's a shit to, to get out 50 odd minutes of um of a movie that's a hectic schedule yeah it is a testament to the guys i think like it was um I could be wrong, but I think they sort of struggled to make it feature length. Mm -hmm. And then on this new project that we've done, Wider the Mark, they're like pulling their hair out, trying to make it short enough. Because wow. we were like three days into this unbelievable Tassie adventure and they're like, we have an hour's worth of footage right now. Damn. Yeah, and we did a 14-day yeah. trip. So you can yeah. imagine they're like trying to find this thing down. And I think um, there's just so much awesome stuff that we come across but mm. we're not even going to be able to show everyone we sort of like wow during the planning of the trip i wanted to make every day like the best day 
Yeah. And then that almost worked to our disadvantage because we just have so much stuff and only an hour to throw it in. So who's like, was that your, con- so we'll go to wider the mark. Was that your concept? Uh, no, that was sort of in between you. Yeah. That was a, a collaborative thing. So it actually happened. We'd worked the last, well, I didn't work the last 12 months. The boys had worked the last 12 months sort of editing handcrafted on the side yep. and we'd released it by the time it came out we were like we didn't want to fuck around and like get people on board to help us market this film yep. we we're like fuck it we'll do it ourselves we like released it at my mate's barber shop we hired a screen put on beers for the night compliments of the young henry's guys that just come to party with us anyway <laughs> um got a bunch of our mates around there's like 70 of us there we viewed the film that night i like hit the button on youtube and we just let it go um yeah. and then like you know the you know picked up momentum with a bunch of like film festivals and stuff like that but that night we had an after party at my house and we were all sitting around having beers and we were so stoked like yeah. this stupid thing that we did and everyone was frothing out on it and you know we were a few beers deep and we were like, all right, well, what are we going to do next? And I thought, well, we could build adventure bikes and yeah. go on an adventure. <laughs> and then that's so this sort was of, that night. Yeah, the, the night we released Handcrafted, the idea came about. And, you know, maybe like a week later, we were having beers again. Justin was around in my place and we were just chilling out in the pool and was talking to the guys, uh, Cameron, who was living with me at the time. Jake was there and we sort of like, right, oh, we can probably like make this happen if we've got this momentum with yep. zero sponsorship and all that sort of stuff, what's not to say we can't do something better and, and bigger next time with a bit of backing from a few businesses here and there. Um, and then, you know, what followed was 12 months of horrible sponsorship meetings and getting told no until a few said yes. And then, yep. yeah, we just made it happen. So who came on board in the end? Oh, man, I'm going to f- fucking forget someone now. The Bell Helmets, Seven Friday, they're like a watch and sunglasses brand. DNA performance filters. I work with those guys pretty closely like every week. For the shop. You know, they've been with me since like the start, giving me cool products and, you know, helping me out. Um, So they were on board. Motul, Shannon's Insurance. Quadlock? Yeah, Quadlock. Yeah. You put me on the spot here. I I can't forget one of them now. Um, Shit. I'm sorry for whoever I've forgotten, but that's the way I can't yep. remember. Yeah, yeah, we had, I think there was a total of like nine people come on board. Perfect. Um, which was, you know, enough and, but it was a hard sell. Like, so it wasn't easy. Like you, you've, you've obviously no. put something out into the ether. You've put a 50 minute movie out. Yeah. And then the second one, it was still very difficult to, to get well, the traction. It was, if we'd sort of said, hey, we want to recreate handcrafted with, you know, international builders from America and France and Europe yep. and, and all this sort of shit, that would have been easy. But we were showing them this sort of film that was totally garage centric and that was more about the creative side of what bike builders do and yep. why they do it and why they're so passionate about it. But we, what we were pitching was, you know, that sort of handcrafted thing took place within the first 10 to 15 minutes. But after that, we were just on this wild adventure. So it was always like, it was so far removed from what we'd done before. Yep. It didn't really help that much. Yeah. Um, it was sort of like we did send, you know, with our with our sponsorship pitches, we were sending the link to Handcrafted out to watch it, but not everyone's got 50 minutes to uh, to sit down and do that. A lot of them did and they were stoked on it. But um, yeah, it was a, a hard thing to get across the line for sure. But like all things, that first step is always going to be the hardest. So yep. once we sort of figured out that we wanted to do it. I committed to it. I just worked until it happened. Yep. Um, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't a high scale production by any means. The guys like they were far better geared up and stuff like that this time around for the yep. adventure sort of filming that we did. So the footage and stuff that we got was impeccable and just unbelievable stuff and just the scenery, like you can't go wrong, but, um, once we committed to get it going, it was a, a big, big task to sort yeah. of c- try to communicate that and put enough energy into it that these sponsors were like, righto, let's give these nut jobs a crack. <laughs> yeah. 
How did you how did you go about assembling the, the crew? Like your your bunch of writers, your friends obviously. But <laughs> have happen? you seen that uh that Rick and Morty episode where they have the heist? No. And then he walks, he's like, I'm I'm assembling a crew and everyone was just like, <laughs> You son of a bitch, I'm in. It was no, just like that. It was simple, man. I yep. we had like one writer that pulled out, um, but it sort of ended up working out for the better because yep. we got Emma McFerrin on board and she's just a fucking rat bag, like yep. so much fun. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was like, I mentioned it to Justin and he was like, I'm coming. So Justin's pop bang? Yeah, yep. we didn't have a choice. Yep. Even if I didn't want to bring Justin, which I did. Yep. He was like, yep, I'm coming I'm no in. matter what. And then um, uh, Max sort of come about like, he just loves doing stupid shit like that. Like if you give him a dumb bike and tell yep. him to do something off road with it, he'd be like, yes. I'm he's here. just an adventurer, eh? Yeah, he's, he yep. just likes to have fun. And then obviously that sort of worked in, oh, Kinmoto, another one of our sponsors. Yes. Yep. Great gear brand, just for anyone wondering. Yep. Um, so yeah, a Kinmoto came on board and that was sort of, Max came part and parcel with that, which was awesome. Um, Maddie Mac, because I sort of know that that CV 650, he'll just push it anywhere it needs to go. Yep. Um, so he came on board. Our other bike builder, uh, Keely Pritchett from Sydney, he's like this uh, this young mechanic uh, mate of mine who I'd sort of met just from being around Sydney when I was like working away a lot. I used to hang out a lot of like shops and go meet people in Sydney. Yep. So Keely was a guy that I met. I really like him. He has like just this hilarious attitude to everything. So we wanted to bring him on board because he's really ambitious and he built this stupid vintage Triumph. It was unbelievable. He did all this custom-made alley body work for it. For the trip. Yeah. Wow. So he built like his tank and tail from scratch. And like if you're taking a 1970s Triumph on a two-week adventure, you are in for a troublesome time. Pack your spinners. But he knew it and he was yeah. like, I don't care. So he like rebuilt his bike, the top end on it twice during our trip <laughs> out of the back of the van, which was yeah. unbelievable. So like everyone really bought something awesome to the table. Yeah. And Emma, Emma came about, we had a, um, because we were going to Tasmania, we had a local rider there that I was sort of hoping would show us around. Um, due to like unforeseen circumstances, she couldn't make it. At the time, I was building Jake a bike, the filmmaker. Yep. We had this idea. We're like, righto, let's build a bike for you. I'll do the work for free. You can film it for free and we'll like call it even. So just yep. like a, that's a pretty much a thing that started the YouTube channel. Um, so like we had this bike there and we're like, fuck, we don't have a rider. We wanted to make sure that we definitely had a female rider with us because like, I mean, regardless of how many there are out there, that's definitely a, a subsection of motorcycling that had to be represented and we just yep. didn't want to be like a bunch of fucking dudes out there doing dude stuff so sure. uh like emma was an obvious choice i don't know why i didn't think of her to start off with so it was really late in the game i said hey em do you want to come ride this trip that we're doing because maddie was already on board she's like already heard about it. she's like yes before i even finished the question awesome yep. um but she didn't have a bike so the filmmaker jake was generous enough to lend her his bike for the trip um and then once we got it back i just sort of like fixed up all the busted shit on it like all the bikes just got absolutely ruined the whole yeah that yeah they just got put through hell for two weeks and there was no holding back on them that was like the one thing that we didn't want yeah. we're like don't worry about your bike getting broken it'll like it'll come around just like go have this most the most fun that you can on this thing so um yeah, I fixed up a bunch of the stuff when we got back and yeah, now he's got his bike back a little bit. So what was his that Emma rode? What was that? Emma's was a, a Sol Invictus Nemesis 400. So they're yeah. like a single CC, uh, sorry, single cylinder 400 CC bike. Um, Sol Invictus donated the bike to us for us to build like for the YouTube series as like a promo deal. Um, so that was like already there and done and sort of, Jake wasn't too deep in, on the hole on it. So, but, it, you know, he was willing to let it go for the good of the film, which yep. is like, that's just an awesome thing about those for two sure. boys. They'll like eat crackers and cheese for two weeks if it means that they have more budget to make a film sort of thing. They're like so fucking committed. I love that. So, um, yeah, that's how that came about. It was like, now that I look back on it, it couldn't have been anyone else. Like yep. the crew that we had down there and just like the shit that went on was so fun. 
And I said to him at the end of the trip, I was like, I couldn't have imagined it going any better. The run of weather that we had, like we got caught out in some shit sometimes, but that just all added to the project that we were doing. Sort of everyone bought something different to the table with like a few of the bike builders there. And then obviously like having Maddie and Emma there, they're like ultimate instigators of just sort of like pushing you that little fun extra time. bit, you know yep. what I mean? So like sure. when someone was having a, you know, a bit of a shitty time on their bikes, they're always the one that's like, come on, you know, like you can do it, go a bit further, like yep. twist that throttle on and just hold it out. So yeah, it was just great. And, you know, having like Justin and Keely, they were my saviors. Like I would have hated to be the only guy that was sort of knew his bike back to front on that trip. So like when I was just off the planet stressed out about where we're we going to eat next and all that sort of stuff trying yep. to like hold the together. logistics yep yeah it was that was a wild task in itself um so like we'd pull up and the boys were always fixing each other's bikes and so sort of everyone was you know putting something in and then um we had like a donny came with us dylan my fabricator right. yeah i sort of i asked him to come along just as like a, a helping hand which was awesome because he was sort of ended up being the the cornerstone of our of our morale in the groove. <laughs> like he just always has a great attitude, which is great. Yep. Um, and then our photographer that was there also, Lex, um, sort of just jumped in head first and was both like photograph, uh, ph photographing most of the trip as well as like being, you know, second or third camera for the electric bubble guys doing drone work and stuff. So yep. in a project like that, when things are tight and you don't have all the resources in the world, it's like so important that everyone just gets in and gets it done, which just is clicks. exactly what happened. So that's perfect to come back from that and speak so positive of every facet of oh, it. Oh fuck, I hated everyone on the trip. Now, so <laughs> yeah, I mean tensions rise when you're yep. living in each other's pockets for two weeks straight. But it's like at the end of the day, we made something fucking unbelievable happen, yep. and I'm so happy that we put that work in to like um to put that in place so yeah i mean if i was to say anything negative about it it'd be bullshit it was just you know it was unbelievable yeah hell yeah everyone had a fucking great time what did you build for it for yourself i built a 2007 model harley sportster the worst decision i've ever made <laughs> <laughs> how'd it go yeah it was good i mean like it was heavy i'm a small guy um but I sort of did what I could to make it easy on myself. I think like, you know, giving it enough ground clearance and good suspension and just sort of upgrading everything where it lacked yep. um, helped me out a lot. And, you know, giving myself enough time to get used to it. It's sort of like anyone can ride anything if you give yourself the chance. Um, but it was a pig. Like to gear a bike like that down low enough that it's... Um, capable off-road yep. is really difficult because the sort of gear ratios in a in a bike like that are they're not that far apart so like on a dirt bike you have like a low first second third and then they sort of step out in fourth and fifth on and especially like a lot of the adventure bikes yep. where you've got to go from doing tight dirt to highway riding for a while so the sporty sort of struggled with that it, it'll top out at like 100 clicks um and that's first gear idling. I'm still like between 25 and 30 Ks, which is pretty fucking quick on a 230 kilo bike through a single trail, like tight track. For sure. <laughs> so I struggled a lot, but that was part of the fun of it. Um, I think like if you took 30 kilos off that bike, it'd be a whole other, you know, a whole other game, but it's it made it. Yep. That's about all I can say, it made it. Is it a bike that you like, you obviously turned a fair few bikes over. Is that something you keep? Is it pretty special to you? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I I still have it. Yeah. I'll probably keep it for like another ride trip or two. Um, but I'm building another one now for a client that came in and saw me building my first one. And he's like, I want that. So obviously the second time around, his is just turning out way, way better. And yep. I'm jealous of that. So I think like I didn't choose the Sportster because of the trip. I already had it in my garage um, and I was like, right, oh, well, this is my bike that I'm taking. Um, so, yeah, I did what I could to make it off-road capable and reliable. Um, yeah, it, it's sort of my, my biggest mistake, I think, was it's like a late model rubber mount. Mm. And I didn't realize, but those things are like 30 kilos heavier 
just off the bat than the hard mount, like the older model Sportsters. Yeah, up to 99 or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So this one that I'm building right now is a 98. So it's mm. already like miles and miles lighter. Um, but from I think like 267 or – yeah, it's, it's like in the high 260s curb weight like full of gas and all that sort of stuff yep. is what mine was. We got it down to like 235 and that one, it starts at like 235. So I'm looking forward to like chucking that one on the scales when we're done with it, seeing what I can get. And then yep. that'll sort of help influence my decision. I definitely want to ride like a sporty again, just cause it's so dumb to do as an adventure bike. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, it, I just to make it more manageable for me, I've either got to make my bike lighter or get a gym membership. <laughs> it's either human or performance. Yeah, in the bike. exactly right. <laughs> um, I was talking to Emma, and I, th- I think it was day one. Day one was a pretty full on. Is that the day on the set? sand day, wasn't it? Yep. Can yeah. We, can we like? I was. I, I, I'll only talk about things that I would have seen online because you got a lot to come out in the movie. But that was a pretty crazy day by the sounds of it. Yeah, I don't think we haven't really been like holding this close to our chest. We yep. sort of during the trip we were pretty heavy on the social media because we wanted to you know we have like a bunch of mates that all knew about this it's, yep. there's no big uh big secret so we wanted to bring people with us on that trip and yeah day one was like purposefully the hardest day because <laughs> i a lot of people in the lead up i didn't want to yep. give too much away so i'd plan this trip and what a lot of people think adventure riding is is not what I want adventure riding to be. So adventure riding to a lot of people is, you know, taking in some nice scenery, stopping at a pub for lunch, going down a gravel road for the afternoon and ending up at an Airbnb. That's fucking bullshit. I want to go like off-road where dirt bikes go, camp out in the middle of nowhere and eat food off a campfire. That's what adventure riding is to me. So that first day, because everyone was asking me, they're like, oh, what sort of riding are we going to be doing? I'm like, prep your bike to be like a dirt bike. You got to, you know, we're going off road. And I don't think a lot of people really like thought I was serious. <laughs> yep. The first day we headed like straight off gravel roads after like, you know, maybe 45 minutes on the bitumen, down some gravel roads to this like dead end town, straight onto the beach, like down through some tracks. Everyone was crashing like on these stupid bikes that we had built. They were all way too heavy for the job and not really up for it. But we were having the best time and we got onto a beach in Tasmania. It was like 26, 27 degrees, perfectly sunny day. And we just had so much fun that first day, but it was super challenging. Firstly, getting in there, like on sand, especially for me and the boys on Bonneville. So Max and Justin were riding yep. um, Triumphs and we sort of struggled just because our bikes were so heavy. Maddie had a heavy bike, but that motherfucker can do anything. Yeah. Um, Emma's was going really well because it's, just, you know, nice and light. She's an awesome sand rider too. I think they sort of grew up doing that. Keely had a bit of drama on the first day and ended up like meeting us after the beach because he had to like fix his top end. Yep. Um, but yeah, we sort of threw everyone into the thick of it on the first day. And like that was the hardest sort of trek that we did. But I didn't say that to him. I was just sort of like a, this is definitely what we're in for. Yep. Like it's not going to be an easy road. And that like everyone was, especially me, like I crashed probably four times within 100 meters one day on this like super soft sand. Yep. And I, my bike just kept on washing out, washing out, washing out. Um, so that was sort of like, all right, this is what we're in for. Set the move for the rest of the trip. Everyone had already broken their bikes and scratched it for the first time. So yep. that was out of the way. Yep. And then we could just have the best time ever for the next 13 days. So 13 days after that, crazy times. You went up, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, what's it called? The, the big, the, the most amazing, um, basically. Oh, Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder. You yeah. There. Isn't that incredible? Man. Yeah, that afternoon was fun. So that was like probably our third or fourth day. Yep. Each day I kept a journal. So I've been like blogging on the Wider the Mark website. Mm-hmm. Um, so sort of like as a bit of a preview to the movie, I'm like writing about our experiences on the road and stuff yep. like that. Because um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to sort of take what we've done and, and, you know, jump on their own bikes and go and replicate it, which I'd yep. be stoked about. Um, but... You know, a few days in, everyone was getting pretty comfortable on their bikes. We'd set up camp and we just decided to go race up Jacob's Ladder for the afternoon. We must have done up and back 10 times. 
Damn. And each time it got looser and looser and looser and faster and faster until we sort of got to the point where we're like, oh, we should probably stop now. And riding on the side of a huge cliff. Yeah. And it is. Like if you ride that, that is that is so steep down to the bottom. Yeah. I mean, it's all right going up. Yeah, going up back down. Is super fun. Going down is a bit of a task. Yeah. But whatever. It was fun. Yeah, it's awesome. It's just just that view up there is incredible. Yeah. It just added something else like knowing that if you sort of – Slid that bike a little too, <laughs> too much. <laughs> Probably not going home. Oh, it's crazy. The um, the day on the uh, what is it? The west coast. On the west coast, there's the, there's a little ferry over there that comes from. Um, oh yeah, on those white Strong. silica roads. Yeah, yeah. Really, uh, the Western Explorer is the the road that takes you back up. But uh, I, I was actually riding down there at the time and missed you guys on the ferry by about an hour. Yeah, fuck that time that we went down. Yeah, I think there was like. Each person knew someone that was down there at that point in time. So like, even on the ferry over, there was probably 80 to 100 bikes. Really? Yeah, there yep. was, it was just packed. And then the ferry guys were like, yeah, there's so many bikes there at the moment. Yep. So, yeah, it's um, we sort of did a, a complete lap yep. plus a little bit of like darting around to a few special spots. But, um, yeah, the West Coast was sort of unbelievably beautiful. We just got so a bit of shitty weather there, which is all sort of nice. Yeah, you know this. These you know scenes within the the film that are just this like really moody ocean and smashing up against rocks, and we're camping right on the beach and yeah, yeah, all that sort of getting stuck in the shit is all part of the the experience. So it's because it's so it sparse, isn't it? Too like yeah. West Coast is just you know there's that Western Explorer that you get off the ferry over there and it's just yeah, it's just so different different to anything. Yeah, well, like you get all the all the nice stuff on the East Coast, but yeah. then that that rugged West Coast. I really liked it. I was sort of, when we got down the bottom, I was stressed beyond belief because yeah. my rear, like I had a stock Harley hub on the back of my Sportster with a chain conversion and it just kept on tearing spokes out. So yeah. I pulled over at one point and there was like six busted spokes just from like giving these bikes hell for the last, yeah. I think it was like five or six days in at this point. So I had to like quickly get these spokes airbagged down to me from ashes spoked wheels in brizzy yeah they airbagged them down to me at uh indian motorcycles hobart um the guys there were like i just i called them up i explained the situation I'm like mate if i can't get this wheel fixed i'm like i'm toast and they're like no worries park your bike here for the weekend um your parts should be here on monday you can come back then use our shop to rebuild your wheel and get you on your way so like they let me use their time machine, their like wheel truing stand and stuff. So mm. I, I relaced the wheel, got it all sorted out, found like a broken bolt on my sprocket. So I like all this shit that I should have just done a cush drive conversion. Yeah. Like the, the Harley hubs just weren't up for this like chain off-road sort of vibe. So um and that's something that I've improved on this on this latest project. So yeah, anyway, before we hit the West Coast, I had to like rebuild this wheel in a in a shop chuck it on the bike and hope that it made it for the last seven days that we had to ride. I missed three days worth of riding Yeah, right. because of that. And then I had to catch up with the crew. And did it make it? Yeah, it made, made it. the whole way after that? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've been riding around with a busted spoke on the rear because it's happened again. I'm yeah. just sort of waiting out. I've, I've worked out a way to do a um, like a, an adventure hub conversion. So like taking uh, hubs and wheels off uh, like – uh, they're aftermarket, but they're from like an adventure bike. Yep. So they're like cush drive, better brakes than the Harley. So they've got like Brembo Brembo brakes and I could do like a twin disc conversion on the front and they fit in pretty easily because the axle sizes are, are pretty close. So like it's a matter of swapping out the bearings and they go straight onto the setup that I've got. Perfect. Yeah, which is hopefully going to save me like so much heartache next time around. So next next adventure that you do, you, should, you shouldn't probably have that issue anyway. I don't think so. Yep. Well, I, f I hope not because it sucks, but I definitely will be taking some spare spokes with me. For sure. Yeah. It's just like a, a huge oversight on my part because we were so under the pump with like organizing everything and the spokes on like a road hub yep. are bent at like a 90 degree angle. Right. Whereas if you look at any off-road hubs, they're normally like a 10 degrees. Pretty. You know, that those hubs are made differently yep. and the spokes are either straight or on like a very minimal bend, which allows heaps more flex. Yep. Um, and yeah, just a massive oversight on my part, but I definitely paid the price for it. Yeah. So you missed three days from that. How'd you enjoy bed in the shed? Bed in the shed was awesome. 
Yeah. Good place, eh? Yeah. But so like as much as we like got out there, yep. if you're going to do that for two weeks straight, we would have killed each other. Yep. Like everyone just sort of, you get a bit over it, you get dirty and like, you know, you want to have a decent feed. I mean, we were eating well and off the campfire, but throughout the trip periodically, we'd set up these nice stays for everyone. Yep. And bed in the shed sort of couldn't have come at a better time. We had a bunch of trouble with a few of the boys' bikes and we were all sort of like coming off the back of, I think it was like three days straight, like in the middle of nowhere. Yep. Um, rocking up to bed in a shed that had like a full, full-fledged workshop yep. that the guys, you know, took over for the night and <laughs> Max actually like broke their vice in the shed <laughs> it's so max blew it blew a couple of his shocks out on the bonneville and he got some sent down from a mate that landed like that day yep luckily there's so much lucky stuff that happened on this trip but someone sent him uh some shocks down and we had to press the new um like bushings into him so it was like doing it on a vice and it was this old shitty thing and just broke so he had to like air freight them a new vice after we left oh, no. <laughs> stuff like yeah but bed in a shed was wild it's such a nice place with yep. like that big open plan living room obviously you've been there right yep. Yep. and yeah i couldn't have think of a, a better place to just sort of like chill out they give you a free courtesy bus to go to the local pub it's crazy yeah it's unbelievable like such a cool spot and the way that it's decked out with all that old race memorabilia stuff. and stuff it's so cool yeah it, it, it blew me away like same deal like it's, it's pretty much right in the middle of tassie pretty, pretty much pretty, pretty yeah, close bang you know? on. and you know you just rock up to i forget the town now but you rock up to the town and Bang! Here's this beautiful, like, yeah, really cool accommodation, and yeah, I, I loved it. I Were you it riding awesome. with a bunch of yeah, bunch I, of blokes? I um no, I uh, I film on Blokes World, so oh, okay. we've done two two series in Tassie in the past six months. What do you do? Just like go visit a bunch of blokes with cars and stuff? No, it's not traditionally blokes. It's called Blokes World, but we go cars, bikes, and go to different sheds and yeah, right, yeah. So we've been to. Yeah, like uh, there was a, a truck called Walsing Matilda. It was an um, uh, what was it? Ford Louisville truck that was originally powered by a Rolls Royce jet motor. And it was nice. like some massive innovation that was done for Australia years, years ago. And it's just ended up in Tassie in a shed and just go and find those sorts of things. And that's cool. We've done two Tassie bike tours. And the second one was the week that you were there. Yeah. And yeah, literally was sort of zigzagging paths. I was texting like Emma, Are you did this such and such. And the people on the ferry told us, yep, we missed you by probably an hour coming over the west coast ferry so oh that that little ferry that little ferry that yeah. Pine, Pineman river or whatever ferry yeah yeah, yeah. and they said no oh, no there's some people from queensland and just come across like an hour. and that is remote like yeah that's, that's no, there. there's no one there and uh yeah it's kind of weird <laughs> so max's bike had this like niggling issue whenever it rained it would like fuck it up really <laughs> so we pulled off at this pub and they were so off us because we were like dirty and rowdy yeah. and like getting on the beers and <laughs> we had to like we were like, oh, we like quietened down, spent a bunch of money over the bar. So they were sort of okay with yep. us at this point. And then um, asked them if we could push our bikes up onto the um, onto the balcony and like work on them. So, yep. you know, that big veranda that they have around the pub. Yeah. We had our bikes set up on there, working on them, fixing That's them. That's that place at that, just as you get off the ferry. As right there, yeah. Because that was a shitty day. Yeah, it was that horrible. That was a horrible day. But that was probably one of my like – best memories from that trip i mean there's so many of them but coming so we were coming from the west yep. heading back across east towards cradle mountain the next yep. day um so riding through those like white silica roads in that incredible green forest it's and incredible it was like foggy and raining it was just like out of this world that sort of experience like i don't mind getting rain on i don't mind getting cold that yep. if that's the trade-off like i'll happily do it that was yeah that for me Exactly the same. I was actually only looking at the footage the other day. We we're in the middle of doing our edit for the show and coming through some of that area, the white road, it just, just contrast, pure yeah. contrast. It was Unreal. And then it sort of opens up into those hills, yep. you know, and that's, I mean, that was a pretty sketchy ride down on a bunch of bikes with knobby tires yep. heading down that range. You know, it's, it's quite like windy roads and it's all just like cold and slippery. Yeah. But it's, it's an adventure. Yeah. Hell yeah. But like a sort of, each day we would get off and, you know, someone would be like, that was fucked. <laughs> you know? But the next day you wake up and you're like, all right, you're seeing a few photos and a bit of the footage, you're like, that is awesome. You know, it's not every day that sort of shit happens. Nah, that's, that's, 
you know, um, once in a lifetime stuff. You get a good crew, and that, that's that's a real real life changing. Well, event. hopefully not once in a lifetime. Maybe two or three times in a lifetime. A lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> see the if last, we can re up and go again. That last place you stayed looked looked legit. I think it was like a cabin or something. Yeah, that was a um, that was a real sort of off the cuff. You know, that wasn't a a sort of thoroughly planned out thing, and it's right. not a place that you can go and stay at. Right. We uh we met this guy and sort of explained to him what we were doing. Um, he like thought it was the funniest thing ever and saw the saw the bikes that we were doing and yep. he was like, mate, my dad has this old logging hut. It's been in our family for generations and it's nestled away in this, you know, forest near Cradle Mountain. If you can go and find it, my dad would be stoked to have you guys stay there. So we were given this it was in the form of a text message. I wish I could tell you it was a pirate map, but it was a text message <laughs> yep. that it was maybe four or five paragraphs long and it was sort of take a ride off this road and go into you know the forest for three kilometers and then you'll see a fork in the road. Take the first fork yeah. and the second driveway and go down the valley and if you hit the lake, you're going too far, but then turn left and you'll probably get there if you go down the hill. But if you start going up a hill, you got to turn around and we were just like, how the fuck are we going to find this place? <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. wild. So there's like no written address for this place. Yep. Um, we got, I was sort of riding with the uh, the text message in my little tank bag and I'd stop periodically and have a bit of a squeeze through and see what the hell was going on. We eventually made it there and met, um, met this guy's dad. Roy the boy, as he calls himself, after a few few glasses <laughs> of wine, yeah, he's such a great character. Yeah. Like, he stayed with us for the afternoon, got the fire going, and this place, like, it had a petrol jenny out the back, so you yeah. got the lights on, and we sort of cooked everyone a big feast. That was our last night before we got on the ferry. Yep. Cooked everyone a feed, gave everyone a thanks very much, and um, like Roy was there for the afternoon and then split off. But we met the guys; they sort of come down and hung out with us for a drink in the Arvo as we were sort of celebrating and. Yeah, looking back on the trip and then that was it. It was done and dusted, uh, two arduous days of driving six bikes back to Queensland from Tasmania, wow. yeah. Yeah, right. So you obviously had your van there. Yeah, we took the van and uh, another like high fall drive. So yeah. like it was pretty tough because you sort of need, I mean, the ideal vehicle would be like one of those VW four drive vans. Yep. Um, but that just wasn't an option for us. So we had my van uh, that would sort of take gear and then we would condense the gear into the four-wheel drive, go off-road where we needed to go, yep. uh, leave the van for however long we needed to leave it for, and then sort of circle back, pick up the van, and take it to the next, next spot. spot before we like darted off the road. Um, it got like a lot of the places were quite accessible. Um, I mean, I wouldn't recommend you take your own car there, but yep. if you want to push it up, it yeah, you can do it. Um, but yeah, so we had two support cars uh, with like the, the film crew and all their gear and stuff in it. And we also we had to like make sure that the guys are actually like carrying their stuff because yep. that's, you know, you got to do that. It's, it's all part of it. Yeah, exactly. So we made sure they're all carrying their shit and packing food and water and stuff like that. But yeah, that's all we needed is two cars. There's, you know, four other people apart from the riders and just got it done. Perfect. Now at the start, you said, you know, you like you like other outdoor stuff. Was, yeah. was this probably one of the best things you've done in, in your life as an adventure? Yeah, sort of. It was pretty good. Like yeah. I'm, I sort of try to push myself into like weird experiences like that yeah. because that sort of thing, it sort of lets you know what you're made of in a weird way. You mm. sort of like when you're in the shit and, you know, there's no one around to help you, you got to rely on yourself and what you know and what you can figure out to like get you out of these weird situations. So. Yeah. That sort of stuff it feels just really valuable in general for me. I really like that. And shitty times where I've like been lost hiking in Canada and like all this like wild stuff where it's been a bit sketchy and a little bit yep. dangerous or whatever, that sort of stuff I'll look back on in even I look back on it now, it's not that long ago. I'm like, that was fucking awesome. Yeah. So I sort of seek out that sort of thing. Um, the trip definitely is a, a massive highlight in terms of what I've done in motorcycling. Um, but yeah, I've sort of like conditioned myself to try to go and like, I don't like those holidays where you sit on a beach and drink cocktails. They're awesome. But I try to, you know, seek out those weird ones and, and sort of get myself into trouble a little bit, you know? Yeah. Off the beaten track. 
Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't even have to be like, you know, backcountry hiking or whatever. It's just like doing random shit that's not that sad. Just go hitchhiking or whatever. I don't yeah. care. You <laughs> just know? whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, is there any date for Water for Mark? <sighs> no. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, like everything with this project, we yeah. went into it not knowing too much about how this whole deal works. Um, so the guys have done like a smashing effort on getting the film edited and stuff like that. But there's stuff at play with um, like after the film is finished, getting it released. Yeah. There's like quite a, a big lead time, which we didn't didn't expect. Mm. Um, so like you hand the film over to a company and they take X amount of, of weeks to, you know, generate all the content that they need to for promotion and release. Um, yeah. We're sort of like working through that at the moment, um, finding our way. It's all going really positive. Like the people that we've shown the film to are just like losing it about it. Awesome. Um, yeah, which is good because there's nothing really out there like it. So, um, yeah, I wish I could tell you, but we just don't know at yep. this stage. Um, and it's also a matter of like you don't want to push it and sort of inhibit the end product. Yeah. So that working on a deadline sucks for anyone creative. It's um, yeah. It's a part of life, but if you can avoid it, which we can, because it's an independent film, like we're yeah. not on anyone's payroll, so we do what the fuck we want. Yeah. It's the best way to be, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it really is. So now for your for your shop, you end up starting to get into making product. Yeah. Was that something that you f foresee that you were going to do from the start? Well, it's sort of like I was saying before when I was building my first project yep. bike, I um. I had like a few bits and pieces that I wanted to make for it because yep. I was going through uni at the time as well for electrical engineering and I'd learned how to like design stuff in CAD and like yep. CAD programming and stuff, like very elementary. Um, but all the shit that I make is like geometric shapes anyway. It's, yep. You know, anyway, uh, I sort of started making a few things and in order to get that stuff made, they're not going to make like one for my bike, you know. So I had to like bullshit these places that were going to make it in yeah. essence to be like yeah i'm a business i'm going to like make you know 10 or 20 of these yeah. as a little sample and then you know maybe one day yeah it, it actually turned into one day so it started like that i grew the product range a little bit i'm sort of always working on something new um and struggling like it's a it's a tough task running a bike shop as it is let alone having like an e-commerce business where you're not just selling other people's products, you're like designing and selling mm. stuff that I make. So it's a tough, tough thing to do, but I think it's worth it. I like, I like having that experience of seeing, like I was in Sydney a few months ago and I saw a guy riding around with one of my headlights on and wow. I was like, that's fucking awesome. Yep. You know, it, all the way down there. And it, that is something that I'm starting to see from people all over the world now, like people getting bikes featured on Bike XF or Pipe Burn or, you know, whatever magazine, um, wearing my gear that I made and that they've like trusted enough to put on their bike, which yeah. I'm stoked about, all these like talented uh, builders all over the place. So that's sort of what I get out of it. Um, it, uh, it helps in a business perspective for like, um, you know, cash flow-ish. Uh, you got to really put a lot of work into like, keeping your manufacturing tight and you know if you make your products too expensive no one's going to buy them so yeah. it's a matter of of really sort of like well for me it's fumbling through it but you really got to put a lot of effort into it it takes a lot like i finish work in the shop here at you know four or five and everyone goes home i cruise back to my house and i'll jump on my laptop again and work on designs or you know talk to you know manufacturers or different people answering quotes and stuff like that until whenever I need to finish. Yeah. Um, so it's not easy, but for me it's worth it because I get that little extra kick of like seeing dudes riding around and I've never met them, but they've got my got my gear on their bikes, which I love. That'd be cool to see. Yeah, really it's awesome, be. man. Very rewarding. Because it was, it was actually something I was going to ask you down the track was it, it's such a balance for you. You've got a balance. You've got an e-commerce business. You've got a social media platform. You've got a manufacturing business and you've got a custom bike business. That's 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 – uh, probably something that hasn't happened too much. It's starting to with other businesses around nowadays, yeah. but not in the past, eh? It's quite a... Well, I, no, I'd hate to say that I was the first to do it. I'm sure other... I mean, no one's probably done exactly what I've done, but yeah. it's sort of... Yeah, I don't... Like I was saying before, like I fell into this bike building thing almost yep. by accident. I just, I just sort of roll with it. 
And, you know, if someone wants to buy my indicators, I'll sell them to you, whatever. Yep. And if they fall away and I never sell a pair again, whatever, I'll find something else. Yep. But, yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing and people ask me, they're like, oh, what advice would you give? And I'm like, I don't know how I did it. So I can't really say much to anyone else. Um, yeah, I guess that's just where I stand on it. Did your, So what products do you do? You do indicators? Headlights? A lot of my stuff is sort of based around electronics. Like a heavy portion of my products are around headlights, tail lights, turn signals. I do like a, um, a control module box and handlebar switches. So like the brain that tells your headlight to latch on high yeah. beam and then your indicators to blink. But I do like an auto timeout. I'm that guy that rides around with his blinker on all the time. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> I hate doing this. Yeah. So I made this like the module that I make is like an auto timeout. So it like turns itself off after an X amount of time that we preset yep. and stuff like that. So that's a large part of my thing. Now I'm sort of moving into fabrication products. So I've always made mufflers. Um, so I make just like really bleedingly simple stainless steel mufflers. They're like awesome performing bits of gear. Um, so those are a part of it. And now I'm moving into like the more I build bikes, I sort of, always just through my own sort of style set and the way that I like to do things, I'm drawn to certain types of products. Um, so it's a matter of like identifying the ones that I like. Um, I, I sort of like have partnered with a previous supplier on fenders. So I use a front fender on every single bike that I make. Yep. And generally I can use the same one because the wheel sizes and all that sort of stuff use a universal fender. They didn't make them how I wanted. So I got in touch with them and we sort of came to an agreement where I would let them use my modified design, like update what they've done and sort of give them that to use if they want to, but they would manufacture them for me as well. So there's this, he's actually an Australian guy based in Sweden now that does my front fenders. Um, and it's just sort of like these little tweaks to make them better and to make them more usable for more people. A lot of people can't aluminium weld. And what I found myself doing was on these fenders that I was fabricating and and making like the bracings for to mount them on whatever bike, I would weld bracing underneath so you didn't have to have a bolt and a nut underneath like in between your fender and tire because that's ridiculous. So I'd weld these braces on the fender and drill and tap it. So instead of me doing that every time, I make a hundred of them at once and then someone else can buy that if they want to do the same thing. So that's sort of like how... I like, again, like just rolling with what I yep. see and, and what I end up using a lot of the time, fabrication stuff like stainless steel, like I sell a mounting kit for yep. front fenders now with like a bunch of countersunk bungs and stainless steel screws so you can make really nice looking fender brackets, but they're so unaccessible for someone who doesn't have a lathe. Mm. So those like, because I know what those struggles are because You've I came from it. that, you yep. know. So I can sort of like find those little bits and pieces that I can make someone's life easier and that's where I put my energy into products now. So you've, you've found all the pitfalls. Well, not all of them and I still got fucking heaps of my own. But yeah, I mean, it's a matter of just like live and learn. Yep. You know, I'm learning stuff every day still in here and, you know, everyone that works for me, Dylan is always teaching me new shit or a different way to look at something. So yep. yeah, after, you know, when you're pumping them out, you find that you fall into these little comfortable areas and then that's generally where I can be like, right, I can make a product for this. So I can, firstly, I can do it easier and quicker, give my customers a better end product for cheaper and I can sell that to someone else if they want it. 100%. With, um, without budget in mind, what would be a dream bike for you to, as a custom builder? Is there one? Yeah, probably if I thought about it. I don't know. I feel like every other fucking bike builder, if I said a Vincent Black Shadow or some bullshit like that, but Whatever, man. I like working on anything. I sort of like weird, different stuff like that people haven't done too much with before or... Yeah, I couldn't really say. Yep. I sort of... I'm happy to work on a uh, 2019 Husky. I'm also happy to work on a 1972 Honda. Like, it's it's all love for me. I don't really mind. As long as my client's happy at the end of the day and I can make something cool, get a bit like weird with it, I'm happy. Were you someone that looked for like a sense of community in a way of like, say, Motor Social, that was one of your events? Yeah. Was that something that you, at the time, and I don't know, are you still... Do, I mean, yeah, tough COVID time really moment. kicked that one in the dick, but yeah, whatever, it's um, it's still there. I just haven't yep. been able to put that time into it and the event sort of stuff has really dropped off now. Um, yep. We'll kick it back in the guts again for sure, yep. but it's just a matter of when. I think like coming into summer, I might start doing stuff now that bars and stuff are open again. Yep. It was a great thing, wasn't it? 
Yeah, we liked doing it. It was just a way to sort of bring people together. And I mean, it's there's a bunch of other events out there like it, but mm. I didn't run any of them. So I just thought I'd just do my own thing. And um, yeah, it's a fun day. Everyone comes down and sort of try to let people know that it's like a party. It's not just like, you rock up for your bike show and polish your yeah. bike and stand around and talk shit for a few hours and then go home. Like tried to, we held it at a bar so you could, you know, park your bike there overnight, leave yeah. it there, not worry about it, come pick it up tomorrow and like come and get on it with us, you know, yeah. like everyone gets on <laughs> yeah. the beers and has a good time because like, yeah, it, that was sort of what we wanted to create that's not really out there. You know, you have your socially responsible motorcycle events where people are worried about insurances and, you know, like you can do whatever you want when you come to a moto social, just yep. don't ride your bike after you've yep. gone drunk. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Park but, your bike and yeah, come inside. There's like a huge community of young guys and I know they all like having beers and stuff. So, you know, try to create a space where that's okay to do and you can go for a cool ride. And we wanted it to be sort of like we would go out for a ride and then afterwards you would come over to my place, we'd have a barbecue, smash beers and you could leave tomorrow. That's yep. sort of what we wanted. Yep. Um, and yeah, we sort of, we did a pretty good job at creating it. The crowds grew and grew until we had to cut it off because of all this stuff happening. And like the venue that we're using um, is sort of like in a transient position right now. Like they might be selling out or whatever. Um, but yeah, through Moto Social, I was able to like, secure like running the gentleman's ride which is another like big motorcycle charity yep. event and we sort of like built in a bit of a party on the back of that as well um it's just a good thing to do like if you're a part of a community and you're not actively working to try and make it better or improve it in somehow it's sort of a waste of time yeah so. wasting things yep. yeah i just i mean it's nothing for me to be out to you know i can put the word out on social media and if you want to rock up rock up if not also fine fine <laughs> yeah <laughs> What can we see out of you over the next 12 months, do you reckon? Oh, Shop, personally? So much, mate. Yeah? Yeah, I've Just always stacks. got, yes. Oh, man. It, like, pains me to think about how yep. much shit that I have coming up because I've got to get through it all. But um, I guess, like, most recently or, or the closest to, to coming to fruition would be our uh, our YouTube series build on the Husky Vit Pillin. Yep. We're sort of doing a a project build on that. It was just a bike that I ended up getting cheap off a, a mate of mine and is an awesome base for a project. I really love the bike. Um, super fun to ride and they look cool too. So we're sort of putting our own touch on that, doing a bunch of mods to it. And hopefully we're going to give the thing away once we're finished with it. Um, after I give it a good test ride, a very thorough test ride. Yep. Uh, I've got like a my first sort of retro racer that I'm bringing out. You can probably see it blurry behind me here. Um, a VFR 750 that I'm pumped on. It's like a really different bike for us. And then just like, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I'm sort of always releasing new products and trying to like better what we're doing. And, you yep. know, I want to get a bigger shop soon, get more more tools or more toys so I can start building better bikes. And, you know, consistent improvement is what we're going for. And, and if we start to stagnate and I'll get bored and PBM's probably going to call it quits at that point. Yep. You know what I mean? Like there's no point unless Just we're doing something going. new and something fun. So, Tell you what, you had a pretty cool CBX in here for a bit, didn't you? I've still got it here. It's been put on the back burner. I've, um, it was a CBX though, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. 1981 CBX, like super sport or something. I don't yep. know. Six cylinder, uh, thousand cc. Everyone always asks me these like tiny details about specific yep. motorbikes that I work on, and I'm like, man, I work on ten different bikes a week. Yeah. <laughs> and I like do not have the capacity to learn yep. every nut and bolt about that bike. But yeah, so CBX, the six cylinder Honda, big yep. fridge. Um, it's lucky the dude we're building it for is also a big unit. Yep. So he's going to be able to wrestle the thing around. But <laughs> I'm waiting for um, a couple of wheels for it. So we're getting these specialty wheels built. I'm a distributor for a brand called Johnich. They make these like, they're basically an art form of a wheel. They're so yeah. nice. Uh, so we're like making a special set of wheels for those that I'm waiting on. Yep. Um, they should be getting sent out like this week. So that's been put on the back burner a bit. That's why it hasn't been on the socials as much lately. But that'll be coming up soon. I'm pretty pumped on that one. Um, our signature series project for this year was going to be a 71 XS 650. So I had a client from Melbourne contact me about this project with doing a like a proper vintage spec racer that he can track on the weekends, but yeah. it's got to like 
through the week be on display at his restaurant. Wow. So those are two very far apart yeah, two goalposts to work towards. But yeah. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, through COVID, that's sort of thrown us into a, you know, a bit of, I mean, we're doing really well. We're super busy, but it's, um, it's just sort of made us recalibrate. So our projects have shifted and things are getting moved around, but that was going to be our 2020 signature series was this, uh, this vintage XS 650. They're a good base to build off too, aren't they? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I actually bought one myself after we've had a bunch of XS 650 choppers come through here recently. Like at this point, I've got like three choppers that I'm working on right now, which is never a thing for us or it hasn't been in the past. Yeah. It's just sort of coming around that way. Um, so I rode this one that I finished up for a guy and was blown away. Like they're super light, really punchy. The motors are fun, like a twin cylinder. So they're great to cruise around on. Yep. Um, and also thrash. So I went and bought one for myself that it, that's probably going to be my like next year's project build if I get time. But um, yeah, this XS that we were doing is turning out unreal. So I've got like these um, oversized quad leading shoe drum brakes for it that we're going to hydraulically set up. Wow. So instead of having them like cable operated, we're going to put like a hydraulic setup on this big drum brake and just do a bunch of like weird stuff that we can when we get given the freedom to do a project like that and yep. i'm allowed sort of creative control that's when i'll put out a signature series so that's awesome i've done like two in the past or three in the past so i've done a cx 500 a ducati gt 1000 that came yep. out like just before we left for tassie i think and then my sports there was another one just sort of projects that i'm allowed to really go hell for leather on and make the most out of um, to where I see fit. And this project started out and the guy just goes, do whatever you want. Um, so sort of like having that limit, limitless capacity, I'm able to really sort of sink my teeth into and test new ideas that I haven't done before. Um, but again, like that's being put on the back. I, was, I would have loved to be in putting that out in like a couple of months, but yep. it is what it is. And, it, you know, hopefully we'll get it finished up for the years out. That'd be cool. Cool to see. Was that CX was the one that was in a couple of shots of handcrafted in that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. actually working on it at the time, at the time. That we filmed it. Yeah. yeah, that was a really testing like project for me, and that's where the idea of a signature series came out. Yep. I think like for us, we work on so many bikes, and we sort of pump them out, and I never wanted to put myself out of reach for yep. the everyday guy. So yeah. we'll still build you a bike, like that you don't want to put a million dollars into. Yep. And I'll always do that. I want to do that because that's where motorcycling is f- predominantly. Yep. But as I started to develop and sort of get better, I started to get these higher budget projects that were something special. So I felt the need to sort of delineate that a little yep. bit and sort of make make the projects that we do for the most part still accessible for anyone. But if you want that wild bike that, you know, people just hang out the window at the lights for and something that I can really go gnarly on, that's where our signature series lies. And that's what that is sort of for, to just have that there on the sides, be like, yeah, we can do this, but we'll still do your like everyday SR 500 if you need us to. It's good to to be able to give people that option too, isn't it? Yeah, well, some guys just want like nothing but the absolute most unique and best will do. And that's when I say, well, look, if you want to go real deep on this thing, we can build you a signature series project and it's going to be out of control, but you can't have anything to do with it. Yep. Yeah, you stay <laughs> yeah. at home. Yeah. yeah you sit <laughs> on the Let end. me do my thing. I'll call you when it's done. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. But it's, it's, I also am really thankful that we've sort of gotten to the point where I have clients that trust us that much. Yep. Um, which is amazing. And it's sort of happening more and more now. Um, we still have, you know, there's some customers, as always, that sort of jump in and try to micromanage you, which sucks, but yep. you just got to play the game. But yeah, to, for us to have that sort of client base that trust in us so much that they can just sort of bring us this bike and expect that they're going to get something that they're super yep. happy with, I, I'm so grateful for that. Like I couldn't ever imagine that someone would roll a bike in here and be willing to just go, go for it. It's obviously respect that you've earned through the community already <sighs> from what you've built. Luck, I'm, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've, yeah, I just I know, try to do my thing and do the best that I can and yep. hopefully that's good enough. Well, mate, we've sat here for an hour and 20. It's, it's quick. quick. It's gone very quick. So thank you so much for obviously your time. We had a uh, faulty spark plug on the first one, which is my, my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, we'll, um, yeah, we'll get this out in a, uh, in a couple of weeks. But once again, thank you so much. Can't wait to see your movie. 
Thanks, it's going to be huge. And um, yeah, continue seeing what you build. I follow everything that you do and love seeing your parts and everything that you've created. It's, it's yeah, someone comes from myself from a technical background. Yeah. Just love to see the detail. So thanks, That's mate. awesome, man. No, I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having me on. It's always a humbling experience to sit down and talk to someone who's sort of like so up to date with what we're doing. It weirds me out. It's cool, man. <laughs> thanks Once again, lot. thanks heaps, mate.